Hit my finger. Uh, meeting call to order. Clerk Beck. Here. Councilmember Feller. Councilmember Curry. Here. Mayor Wood has laryngitis and is not available today. I need to call this out real quick. So we'll be meeting in closed session to discuss item one on the agenda conference with labor negotiator involving um, the Oceanside Fire Association, the Western Council of Engineers, Oceanside Police Officers Association, Nonsward, and the management employees of the city of Oceanside. Item two is conference with legal counsel on anticipated litigation in one case. Deputy Mayor Lowry? Here. Councilmember Feller? Here. Councilmember Kern? Here. Councilmember Sanchez? Here. Mayor Wood is absent with laryngitis. Yes. Didn't want to share it with us. No. For this time, you have consent calendar items 3 through 13. Move approval. A second. No public on this item. Motion approved for zero. Item 14 through 18, council reports. Deputy Mayor Lowry. Uh, I took a tour, a long tour of our water and wastewater treatment facilities a few days ago. It's great knowing that our water actually runs downhill from our site at about 30 miles from here where the water begins. So it was really, we have a huge water system and I'm so glad it works. And they also showed us the, the real interior of the uh, sewage system and it's definitely messy down there. Um, and I also got to be there for the 640 liftoff at the Ironman Triathlon last week. They asked if I wanted to fire the cannon or verbally welcome people. And I said the cannon didn't work last year so I would like to welcome the people. And there were over 3,000, right at 3,000 participants, and it was amazing. There were 23 challenged athletes, so those were people who had to either be placed in the water to swim or were on a recumbent bikes where they pedaled with their hands, and that was also very amazing. I was impressed that we had that participation. Also, the um, contract for the triathlon for the Ironman was re-signed last week, so they're here for five more years. So that's all I've got to report. Thank you. Councilor Feller. Thank you. Um, we uh, had a groundbreaking for a citywide solar project uh, a week or so ago. And uh, I, I, it looks like it doesn't pay a lot of dividends right away, but it will start. And that's uh, probably a, a good thing. Went to the Crystal Apple Awards uh, dinner at our uh, reception over at uh, the, uh, the Mormon Stake uh, at, at, uh, in Carlsbad, and we had two of our teachers honored by their students, Kristen Brown, uh, a teacher at El Camino, and Robin Rasnick, and uh, that is probably one of the most gratifying things that you can go to uh, as a council member. They really uh, do do a great job for um, uh, the, the students for their teachers and uh, it's it's quite an honor to watch the, the students introduce and make uh, a big deal out of their teachers. Uh, we had Sunrise on the Beach on Easter uh, with New Venture Church. Um, it was attended by uh, probably 3,000 of our closest friends and uh, it was a, a great uh, morning. Uh, Save Our Streets had a quarterly meeting at John Landis Park last week, and I think uh, they are uh, on the right track. They're covering all of our uh, 
uh, neighborhoods that uh, are really in need of uh, youth uh, mentoring, and so uh, that's a, a great, great thing. Uh, went to uh, Eric and Molly's wedding in Carmel. That was uh, our whole family pretty much got together. N none of my family down here went, but uh, the Northern California family. Uh, I think I saw like maybe two or three too many environmentalists up there, but uh, I guess that's what you get in Carmel. Uh, Harvey Schwartz uh, has passed away. His service is Saturday morning at 11. Uh, we have uh, a Relay for Life opening ceremony next uh, next Saturday. Ne yeah, next Saturday at 10 o'clock on the 16th. And uh, coming up on the 26th is the Tourism Summit. Uh, we've had birthdays uh, in the last uh, uh, week or so, but the one in spe especially is uh, Jonathan Franklin, who is uh, nine years old, and uh, he is uh, kind of named after me except for the last name. So uh, he's a... Great little guy, so, and that's all I have. Thanks. Councilor Curry. Thank you. The only thing I really, I, I went to the Crystal Apple, and, and, and Councilmember Feller covered that very well. Uh, the only one I want to really mention, and it's an ongoing thing, is the Arts Commission had a public forum um, last Wednesday and about a master plan for arts in the city of Oceanside. And, and they're going to reach out to the public about what we're going to do with art in our city. So um, they have their regular meetings, but they're also going to reach out to, to everybody else to figure out what we want to do. We talk about art in public places. We talk about other um, performing arts, visual arts, those types of things, and what the, the public wants. So I think that's very important as we go forward, because art is an economic driver. And we do have the Oceanside Museum of Art here, which is the center of arts in North County. And, and we have other art venues. Um, one of which is the Phantom Gallery that just opened up on Coast Highway. And, and that's going to be in an empty office or an empty retail space. And that's there until that space gets rented. So that's why they call it kind of a Phantom Gallery. It's their very temporary basis. And it's, um, I don't know the address, but it's like two doors down from Cigar Grotto. That's how I know places. 200 are. block. 200 block. Uh, so I, I encourage everybody to go by. It, it's open. Uh, six, seven hours a day and to, to go by and take a look at that and support the arts in our community. So thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you very much. Uh, there are so many things that happened this past, um, this past week, this past couple of weeks. The one thing that I wanted to um, talk about was that Angie Fusat Flores passed away just uh, uh, not too long ago, March 3rd. Uh, she, of course, sister of Louise Fusat and uh, Clara Fusat, born in Oceanside. She passed at 92 years um, up until her stroke, which happened, I believe it happened around January. Um, she was very active. Um, she actually was my Aunt Angie through, through marriage. Um, on my dad's side, member of the Samuel Band of Mission Indians, um, somebody who really, um, as the Fusats, um, really uh, uh, put their fingerprints on Oceanside in a very, very positive, positive way as, as a member of the Samuel Band of Mission Indians. So I would like to ask um, uh, Deputy Mayor um, Lowry if we can um, adjourn in her name and that again is Angie Fusat Flores. Thank you. Okay, item number 20, what were your numbers, John? 19 and 23. 19 and 23. Okay, item 19, the City Council met in closed session to discuss the status of negotiations with the Oceanside Police Officers Association, non sworn and management employees of the City of Oceanside. Uh, there's no action to report on that item. The council did not meet on item two. And item 23, 
is the adoption of an ordinance of the City of Oceanside amending the zoning designation of certain real property located at the north terminus of Stallion Drive and north of the intersection of Stallion Drive and North River Road from the Agricultural A Zone District to the Residential Estate REA Zone District Bree Property Zone Amendment. Move adoption. No public. Second. Thank you. Motion approved, four zero. Okay, the meeting will resume at 6 p.m. Right now we're finished, so we've got a 50-minute break. Good evening, everyone. The uh, meeting uh, public hearing and other materials are coming up. I want to turn the um, meeting over to Mayor Woods' aide, Debbie, who's going to carry us through. The mayor has laryngitis tonight and decided not to share it with us. So we're grateful to him for that. Thank you. Please stand for the invocation and pledge of allegiance. Tonight's invocation will be given by City Clerk Zach Beck, who is also youth pastor for the Fields Church. Please join me in bowing your heads. Father, come before you and say thank you. Thank you for the privilege, the blessing, the honor it is to reside here in the city of Oceanside. We come together tonight as a diverse community, a community of different backgrounds, different beliefs, different presents, and different futures, yet one common goal, and that is the betterment of the city. We come together tonight to seek your guidance, wisdom, and discernment during the deliberations that transpire this evening, and in doing so, we lift up Councilmember Feller, Councilmember Kern, Councilmember Sanchez, and Deputy Mayor Lowry. May you grant them peace and wisdom during their decisions this evening. And in addition, we lift up Mayor Wood. May you grant his body healing and peace as he deals with laryngitis. We say all these things in your precious name. Amen. Tonight's Pledge of Allegiance will be led by OPD Explorer Brandon Adkins. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Brandon. Next, we are going to recognize two awards given to the, given to the Finance Department, the 2015-16 Operating Budget Excellent Award, uh, Excellence Award and the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Would City of Oceanside Finance Director Jane McPherson please come forward? The Government Finance Officers Association has recognized the City of Oceanside's Finance Department with two awards. First is the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for our 2015-16 budget. 
To achieve this award, the Finance Department had to satisfy nationally recognized guidelines for effective budget presentation. These guidelines are designed to assess how well an entity's budget serves as a policy document, a financial plan, an operations guide, and a communications device. The documents had to be proficient in all four categories <clears throat> to receive this award. The second award received was a certifi Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. This award is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. Please join me in congratulating Jane McPherson and the Finance Department for obtaining these awards. Well, I, I, want to, I want to congratulate Jane. I have no idea who went through all those criteria. That's, it was even hard to listen to those big words. But Jane has prepared a 17-minute speech, and that's why I want to give her the microphone on this sit down. Oh, that's very nice of you, but I think I'm going to have to shorten it tonight. Uh, thank you to my team. Uh, we, I couldn't have done it with the amazing finance team and support of the city manager. Uh, there is quite a few criteria, and uh, we, this is actually our third year that we've been given this honor. And we work hard every day, and we're looking forward to getting many more of these in the years to come. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have the Fair Housing Month proclamation. Would Robert Mikule, Chairman of the Oceanside Housing Commission, and Cecilia Brandran, Management Analyst for Housing and Neighborhood Services, please come forward. Proclamation in honor of Fair Housing Month, April 2016. Whereas the Fair Housing Act was signed on April 11, 1968, just one week after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and whereas this landmark bill, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, resulted from the hard work and leadership of Dr. King and others in the civil rights movement, and whereas this act was an important step toward confronting discrimination against minorities in housing throughout the United States, and whereas Fair Housing Month has helped open doors of opportunity for countless families since its passage, making significant progress in achieving equal housing access for all individuals, and whereas all Americans should know their housing rights, which protect citizens of the United States from discrimination based on race, color, creed, national origin, sex, or handicap, and whereas Fair Housing Month provides an opportunity to place special emphasis on the goal of increasing home ownership throughout our community, thereby enabling families to achieve the American dream. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jim Wood, Mayor of the City of Oceanside, California, do hereby proclaim April 2016 as Fair Housing Month. Furthermore, I encourage all citizens of Oceanside to become more aware of their rights and responsibilities within our community. Issued this 6th day of April, 2016. You guys will have to share this. You all have to share this. Uh, congratulations for bringing all this good work to Oceanside. I want to point out that Cecilia is a staff person, and she keeps our volunteers in line. Bob is here to represent the volunteers. So it's really important in these cases that we have city staff working with community members so that we can keep projects like programs like this moving ahead. So congratulations. And Bob actually has a 17-minute speech. <laughs> Closer to 17 seconds. Make everyone in the audience happy. <clears throat> um, first, I just want to say that I'm very proud to accept um, this for um, 
on behalf of the Housing Commission. Um, there are nine members of the Housing Commission, all volunteers, and they spend a lot of time with reviewing um, items that come up before us, and it's all all put together by city staffs, um, Cecilia Brandaran, uh, Marjorie Pierce, and many others who, um, who devote their lives to helping um, the people in, in need and helping people to find housing. And uh, anyway, um, Fair Housing Month 2016. In April, we come together as a community and a nation to celebrate the anniversary of the passing of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 which is to eliminate housing discrimination and create equal opportunity to housing choice in every community. We will continue to work to ensure that our residents, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, and disability, have access to neighborhoods of opportunity where our children can attend quality schools, our environment allows us to be healthy, and economic opportunities and self-sufficiency can grow. CSA San Diego County, in partnership with the cities of Carlsbad, Encinitas, and Oceanside, will provide a fair housing presentation at the Carlsbad Senior Center, located at 799 Pine Avenue in Carlsbad, on Monday, April 25th at 5.30 p.m. And North County Lifeline has a fair housing summit on Tuesday, April 26th, from 10 to 12.30 at their offices, located at 200 Michigan Avenue in Vista. As we celebrate Fair Housing Month 2016, let us recommit ourselves to working together to create communities of opportunity where everyone has an equal chance to succeed in life. Fair housing means shared opportunity in every community. Thank you. Next, we have a proclamation for 2016 North County Earth Month. Will the following members of Oceanside's Green Team please come forward? Colleen Foster, Senior Management Analyst. <laughs> Cynthia Mallet and Sarah Davis, Environmental Specialist. <laughs> proclamation in honor of North County Earth Month. April 2016. Whereas the mission of the Green Oceanside Campaign for the City of Oceanside is to bring environmental awareness and stewardship to the citizens of our community, and whereas each year Green Oceanside staff members and partner organizations collaborate to present environmental education programs and public participation opportunities that teach our community how to be better stewards of the planet by recycling, reducing waste, composting, conserving water and energy, and preventing water pollution. And whereas during the month of April 2016, Green Oceanside presents Earth Month 2016, offering various environmental events and activities, such as Green Oceanside Business Network VIP events, a used oil filter exchange event, a California-friendly landscape contest, the Loma Alta Creek and Beach Cleanup Event, a Water Smart Landscape Workshop, a DIY Compost Bin Workshop, and an Earth Festival Event in downtown Oceanside. And whereas the Earth Festival, North County's largest Earth Day event, will be held on Saturday, April 16th, and will feature, feature environmental booths, a vintage market, a children's echo zone, water conservation and green home improvement areas, water-friendly landscaping ideas, a bike valet, and live entertainment. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jim Wood, Mayor of the City of Oceanside, California, do hereby proclaim April 2016 as North County Earth Month. Furthermore, I encourage all of our residents to participate in Oceanside's annual Earth Month events to make our community and the world a better place to live. Issued the sixth day of April, 2016. Well, I want to congratulate these uh, 
staff person, staff people who go above and beyond the call of duty. Everywhere I go, they're out there talking about recycling plastic bags or, or showing people how to actually think about making the earth a better place to live for the people who have the, can afford to recycle their materials. And I think it's awesome. So Colleen has a few words to say. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Lowry. Um, first of all, really what we want to say up here is Earth Month, Green Oceanside. Oceanside's leadership towards sustainability has really been an effort not only of our team, but really the community. Um, Cynthia and I, we were here at the first uh, Earth Festival eight years ago now, um, a festival where we had 300 attendees, and now we have 10,000 people on average. So it's really exciting to see Oceanside become a leader here in California. And I'd just like to thank all our community partners, as well as our partners such as Main Street Oceanside. Um, we've gotten a lot of support the past several years from the Rincon Band of the Senyo Indians. They're actually sponsoring um, so we can have 94.9 .9 host our, our stage this year, which is exciting. Um, also, I'd like to thank Waste Management, who's been a, a major partner towards our efforts, and also Goodwill, who's partnering up uh, with us for some new services. That's really going to put Oceanside on the map for zero waste. Um, so, again, thank you to the community, and most importantly, thank you to our amazing team here in Oceanside. So, Cynthia, Sarah, and these are only a few of our, our green team members. So, thank you. Yep, I'm going to uh, add a few things here, too. Uh, water conservation, uh, water pollution prevention, and solid waste and recycling are City of Oceanside programs that work under the Green Oceanside umbrella. And this is a team of staff that work together to protect health of humans, protect our wildlife, and our beautiful Oceanside coastal community environments uh, for our enjoyment. And we would be able to be successful without the help of residents, businesses, tourists and our municipal employees who definitely enact behaviors that help protect our environment. So uh, remember that we do Earth Day is April 22nd every year, uh, but we want you to remember Earth Day every day. Please come out to our Earth Month activities this month. You can find all the information on www.greenoceanside.org. And not only during this month, but throughout the year, you can find tips on how you can help protect the environment. I want to point out one thing on this uh, poster flyer. The, this group of people came up with a new project. It's a partnership with Goodwill of San Diego County and Waste Management. It's called Curb Up Oceanside. And currently, the city has a contract with Waste Management to remove big items at no charge to the people who live in Oceanside. So if you call Waste Management, they will schedule a time and a big truck to come pick up your old stove and your old cabinet, your old chest of drawers. What they have realized is that those materials were 100% going to the landfill. So what's happened with this uh, new curb up Oceanside is that it's going to go to a Goodwill facility first, and they're going to cherry pick the items off the truck that they want to market, and uh, then the rest of it will go to the landfill. So I want to really honor you all, Sarah, for coming up with this idea. This is the first place in the country that a, a municipality has actually put something like this together. So I'm very excited by this pro program. Thank you. Next item is number 22, Appeal of Planning Commission Decision. Yes, item number 22 is adoption of resolution upholding Planning Commission Resolution number 2015-P37, denying regular coastal permit RC14-00002 for the remodel of in addition to a single family residence at 1709 South Pacific Street Applicant, Appellant, Dan Matlock, and Candace Cross.
Good evening, Deputy Mayor Lowry and members of the City Council. Oh, Mayor, uh, hold on one moment. We have to open up the public hearing and uh, make disclosures and const uh, condition on contacts. Uh, opening the public hearing, uh, we have to have disclosures. Yes, uh, I've had um, the appellant, uh, planning commissioners, staff, uh, been by both sides of the site. Um, probably for a mile in each direction, it seems like. So that's it. I met with staff. I got some materials from the applicant, and I also went by the site. Yes, I met with the um, applicant, um, the applicants. I also am familiar with the site. Um, I also spoke with staff and some members of the public. Thank you. I, I uh, actually met with the applicant. I actually did a site visit, um, and obviously I, I talked to the staff and, and then some public input. We actually received some of their correspondence today, too. Thank you. And yes, we've received correspondences in our office, and I also have the master copy of all the paperwork here as well for your, look, for your ability to look at it, but we've already distributed it to all the council members. Thank you. Okay, Marie. Thank you. Um, as stated, item 22 is an appeal of a planning commission denial of a regular coastal permit for the remodel and expansion of a single-family beachfront residence. The property is located at 1709 South Pacific and is shown on this slide with an arrow. The existing house is shown in the upper left and the proposed rendering is, is shown on the upper right. Uh, the existing structure contains 4,091 square feet. The remodel and addition would expand the house by 1,515 square feet for a total of 5,606 square feet with the additional space added to the first and second stories as well as a mezzanine level. The existing first and second story decks would also be replaced and would extend 9.5 and 5.5 feet beyond the string line, respectively. The ceiling of the uppermost floor would be at the 35-foot height limit with the roof, parapet, wall, and chimney extending a bit higher. Um, the applicants have appealed based on several issues, and I'm going to consolidate them for brevity. Appeal issues one, two, and four. The applicants um, state their belief that the project is in compliance with the policies and regulations of the city, that the planning commission has overreached their action in their action, and that they have been denied rights afforded to others. In response, regarding compliance with the zoning ordinance, section 1703 of the 1986 zoning ordinance states that decks may extend seaward of the string line. However, the Planning Commission had an extensive discussion of this issue and they are of, of belief that there should be no exceedances of the string line except in very unique circumstances with a variance. After discussing with the Planning Commission, staff supports this viewpoint. The applicant also um, cited some other projects that he believes are representative of what they're trying to do. Staff believes that some of the other projects are are larger or different, and they don't extend as far as is proposed beyond the string line. Um, also, the LCP, or Local Coastal Program, requires that projects conform to the height, scale, color, and form of the neighborhood, and we believe, as well as the Planning Commission, that the bulk and scale of this project would not conform with the neighborhood. Appeal issues three and five have to do with the mezzanine level and the height. The applicant is stating that the mezzanine is in compliance with the building code and that the height complies with section 1709 of the zoning ordinance. Our building official concurs that the mezzanine is in compliance with the, with the building code. However, the mezzanine also contributes to the overall bulk and scale of the structure which, as we've said, is not compatible with the neighborhood. In addition, Section 1709 does allow you to measure building height to the top of the ceiling of the uppermost floor. However, as stated by Planning Commission, rooftop structures should be minimized, and the project is proposing extensive parapet 
around above the 35 foot height limit as well as a chimney. And this as well contributes to the bulk and scale of the project. In summary, we're recommending that the City Council adopt a resolution upholding the Planning Commission's resolution to deny regular coastal permit RC 14-00002. Thank you. At this time, the applicant has 20 minutes to present. Deputy Mayor Lowry, Councilman Kern, Councilwoman Sanchez, Councilman Feller, City Manager, and City Attorney. Good evening and thank you for your time. My name is Dan Matlock and I'm here tonight with my wife, Candace Cross, and we reside at 1709 South Pacific Street. We, and I'm sure the entire community, wish Mayor Wood a speedy recovery. So to begin with, we'd also like to thank Mary Wright, our planner, for sticking with us through this ordeal. She's our third planner. We're surprised she didn't quit. We know it certainly must be difficult for her with all the competing interest groups weighing in. Now just a background statement before we proceed referencing the traditional project review comment. The, re the review process was anything but normal. It took over one year before a true review of our application took place as evidenced by the billings. The first year we encumbered approximately 1,300 in staff charges and after 26 months the fees have ballooned to approximately $15,000 and counting. And all this for just a simple addition and remodel. So before we get started, we'd like to ask a procedural question of the city attorney. What code are we currently operating under within the coastal zone between Wisconsin Street and St. Malo? Is it the 1986 or the 1992 code? You know, I would recommend that you complete your comments because this is your time and it's running. This is going against your clock. I'm happy to answer questions at the conclusion of your testimony. Okay, thank you. Well, it, we're all assuming it's the 1986 code uh, would, would uh, be your answer. Commissioner Balma, chairwoman of the Oceanside Planning Commission, stated in an article in the Coast News regarding our project and hearing, the commission favors the 1992 co city code which disallows build out over the string line. We're trying to hold to the 92 code we all agree with. And that kind of contradicts the code we're operating under right now. So let's address issue one in the new staff report. The city's support of denial states our project complies with the R1 development regulations of the 1986 Oceanside Zoning Ordinance, except for section 1703E concerning the shoreline stringline setback that states decks may be allowed to extend seaward of the string line, providing they do not substantially impair the views from adjoining properties. Staff originally supported the first and second decks at four feet beyond the string line under the 1986 code. Staff states the extension of decks beyond the city string line, while not directly blocking views, confirms the analysis and review under the 1986 code after two site visits by management and staff. During our hearing, hearing, the planning director, Jeff Hunt, addressed the word may in section 1703E and raised the same logical question I did and he stated, the code clearly says that extensions may go beyond the string line. It's discretionary. You only have to, or you don't have to, but somebody could ask, well, staff states in their original report, the proposed project is in keeping with the residential character of the surrounding area. Staff goes on to state the residents would be 
in, be similar in size to other large homes in the area. On to issue four. The city's response says it well. Staff originally supported our decks at four feet beyond the string line. We disagreed with four feet as four feet prov provides no utility for patio dining. That's why we are here tonight for you to decide what distance is acceptable. Mr. Matlock? Yes? I just want to inform you that you have six minutes remaining. And yes. However many minutes you have remaining will be on the time for rebuttal as well. I understand. You. All right. Thank you. As I stated, uh, that's why we are here tonight for you to decide what distance is acceptable. We are now requesting nine feet beyond the string line that is reasonable and allowable under 1703E. The city's response clearly states that section 1709 of the 1986 zoning ordinance, zoning ordinance limits building height to the ceiling of the uppermost story. Our project design at the mezzanine level is to the 35 feet as measured to the ceiling and reviewed under the 1986 code. The original staff report states it is in support of roof rooftop ancillary features, roof and parapet, in excess of 35 feet, which is under the 1986 code. There are approximately 38 properties within the coastal zone that enjoy the provisions of section 1709 incorporating stairwells and or elevator shafts or parapet walls under the 1986 code. So to recap the additional concessions offered to each of you, and in, spirit of, in the spirit of goodwill, we have made changes and present them tonight for your consideration so that we may resolve all issues under the 1986 code, the code we should all be following. Number one, we have lowered the roof parapet wall 18 inches as requested by the Planning Commission. Number two, we have moved the roof mounted air conditioning units to the outside areas behind the mezzanine level. Number three, we have opened up the side walls behind the mezzanine level adjacent to the air conditioning units, which allows for more articulation. Number four, we have added enhanced high definition reveals to each level to break up the side walls and, and accentuate each floor level as requested by the Planning Commission. Number five, by virtue of the fact that everyone knows that you can't match stucco, the new addition will be accented, accented a different color at the proper break points to provide visual variation. In closing, we respectfully request that you reverse the Planning Commission decision and accommodate the additional changes as previously stated in order to resolve this matter. Our project meets all the requirements of the 1986 zoning ordinance. We have followed 1986 code section 1703E, 1709, including building code section 505 and the LCP. We have not heard one valid argument against our project that can state we are not following the current 1986 code section. All the Planning Commission objections were opinions, beliefs, nothing factual. Planning Commissioners' objections to our project are based upon 1992 code made evident in the hearing, the eight-minute break, and the Coast News article. Our project has been scrutinized, plan review fees of $15,000 and counting, by the planning department for two years under the 1986 code, and we had complete staff approval and support under the 1986 code, including decks of four feet over the string line on December 7, 2015. Mary Wright's presentation for the planning commission was professional, factual, and complete under the 1986 code and the LCP, but was ignored. Rick Brown offered expert assistance multiple times explaining 1986 code sections in depth. My presentation for the Planning Commission was presented with 1986 code sections and the factual history for the basis of section 1703E and it was ignored. We witnessed a group of individuals holding the title of Planning Commissioners that presided over a public hearing with the intent of passing a property rights decision without preparation or knowledge of current 1986 or LCP provisions. Their only concern 
was their personal agenda and fixation on 1992 code not applicable in any way whatsoever to our project. There could not be a more obvious case of selective enforcement than what everyone has witnessed here in this case. The city must honor the code it has on its books, and the city should defend the code it has on its books. We are not asking you to like our project. We are asking you to follow the 1986 rules and to vote according to the 1986 code we are all currently operating under, as I su suspect our uh, city attorney would have informed us, is the 1986 code for that section of Pacific Street. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Malak. You have a, um, after this, you'll have one minute left for rebuttal. I didn't want to eat into the uh, applicant's time, but yes, obviously we're subject to the 1986 code. No one's disputed that. The staff analyzed the project um, based upon the 1986 code. Public. At this time, members of the public have the opportunity to speak on this item. If any members of the public would like to address the council on this specific item, you may come forward and uh, line up at both the podiums, but just to speak on this specific item right now. My name is Donna McGinty. <clears throat> I live at 2405 Mesa Drive. I've lived in the city for 75 years. I'm very familiar with the beach area, as a lot of you who have been here all your lives are. And I've gotten to know the, the owners of this particular property. And uh, I frankly find it very, very hard, having attended these, these planning commission meetings, I, I'm, they're embarrassing to me. I am completely and totally embarrassed by their behavior in those meetings, their sidebar attempts to come to conclusions after discussions have, 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 have taken place and they take a break to go use the restrooms or whatever they do. Those discussions are not particularly private. Um, Ms. Balma, in a recent meeting, gave Mr. Hunt direction to provide a written document for them on the Planning Commission to follow as to code for these projects. Um, it appears to have, this appears to have misled you all in your discussions and on this project as, as well as others they have approved and, and or denied and practiced um, nothing but selective enforcement based only on discussions between them at their meetings and asking you to participate on selective enforcement as in selective enforcement as well. You all have participated in making these decisions based on information you've been given by this planning commission and recommendations you've been handed by folks who know absolutely nothing about what we're discussing here tonight. It's embarrassing. Louise Bama swears she knows nothing about what we discussed in one of those meetings. She wants written documentation for them to follow to conduct these meetings. I have never seen such a misled bunch of people in my life. Ms. Bama admits she does not know what to rely on when those decisions have been made. And all of you, but Chuck, have been party to being allowed, allowing this to happen. You need a new planning commission, and it needs to start today. You all have the power to make that happen. It needs to happen today. This is extremely embarrassing to me, and I'm sure to a lot of other owners of homes in this area. Thank you. Hello. My name is Carolyn Wilt. I live at 1719 South Pacific Street. Uh, some of the people here in the city that have gotten to know me, they call me the fish lady. I did the fish on Buccaneer Beach. And uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, all you council members and the deputy mayor and other officers for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate my statements concerning the string line. 
The string line of 85 feet has been acknowledged by the City of Oceanside and the Planning Commission as the accepted string line for many, many years. In fact, our house, which was completed in 2002, we only went out 80 feet, and our neighbors have respected us and have only gone out 80 feet on their new homes and remodels so that they wouldn't block our view. With our house, we followed the 1992 unapproved code. We did not fight it because it was unapproved. We just followed the rules. I can see no reason why you would even consider the variances that Mr. Madlock is proposing. I understand that several years ago, a huge mistake was made in allowing the residents at 1635 to go out further than the 85-foot string line. This resident now blocks the view of all of their neighbors. We should not allow this mistake to be repeated. We just want Mr. Matlock to follow the rules. I personally would prefer that new projects would have to follow the 1990 unapproved rules, as we did. I believe that a 1992 rules should be approved, and then maybe future problems, such as what Mr. Matlock is proposing, would not be proposed. Mr. Matlock is wanting variances that it will allow here his balconies. I understood it was four feet. He said tonight he wants nine feet beyond the string line and to go two feet above the height restriction to create a mezzanine that definitely is greater than one third the area of the room just below and to call the first floor a basement. In order for the first floor to be called a basement, which I'm sure you all know, it has to be at least 50 percent underground. Mr. Matlock's basement is less than a third underground. The variance Mr. Matlock is requesting go against neighborhood mass and design as established by our Planning Commission. For many years, the Planning Commission has been consistent in protecting all of our rules from any further mistakes. Please protect all of Mr. Matlock's neighbors and do not approve these variances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, Council Members, Jim Out 127, Cherry Lane. Uh, yes, you, you, you can line up at the other podium. And you, can, you can line up and speak at that podium after Mr. Knott has finished speaking. Yeah, no problem. Okay, anybody can. Yeah, anyone is allowed to. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Jim Out 127, Cherry Lane. Uh, this property and my property and where I live at all have the same issue and that we all live in a tsunami inundation zone. And one thing that the public doesn't realize is that the string line, or so-called string line, has changed over the years. And that's also being one of the issues that's come up with also for our sand on our beaches. All that has changed over the years, but yet that has not been remeasured. That has not been realigned. And that's something that the Coastal Commission has not taken action on. Yet up and down the state, a lot of the jurisdictions are taking and putting in tsunami regulations for any type of rehabilitation of homes, like this home. And like in my park, where we're taking and being required that any new installation, it has to be above the 100-year flood level. So the question becomes on this, what is reasonable? And this is something I think the council needs to start addressing. I know this is a little bit too late for this project, unless the homeowner wants to address his own protection for his family and friends and neighbors. Because if a tsunami hits into his home, it's not going to just affect his home, but also the community at large. And this is something that needs to be addressed. And I think our council needs to take, if our Coastal Commission isn't going to be doing something, we need to take that step and actually look at what the new string line is. Because that coastal region with the, so the string line is not accurate anymore. And we need to look at that, and we need to look at what the realities are. Not of what, what was back in 86, 84, 90. 
It's what now is. Because if you go down to Buccaneer Beach, you go down to our main beach, I remember that shoreline being a lot further out. And what was measured then to what it is now is two different worlds. Thank you. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> My name is Dirk Akima. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd just uh, add something here as I'm sitting. Uh, my wife and I were at actually the uh, uh, planning commission meeting that Mr. Matlock's uh, project was uh, was considered. Uh, we actually had another project on the calendar that week that uh, that meeting. So we sat down and listened to his uh, entire presentation and listen to the uh, Planning Commission's uh, discussion and ultimate consideration and vote of it. And I'm just really uh, speaking in, on behalf of the Planning Commission. I thought they did an excellent job that evening uh, considering uh, his project, uh, debating the merits of it, and ultimately coming to a unanimous cons uh, vote 7-0 uh, uh, against it. Uh, I would like to say as an impartial observer that I thought the Planning Commission did a very excellent job and uh, all of them are to be commended for their, uh, for their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, honorable commissioners. My name is Tor Stensford, excuse my voice, uh, 1705 South Pacific, founder and one of the spokespersons for the Association of Concerned Oceanfront Homeowners of South Pacific, formed in 1999 where Ellen Wilt was being attacked and we formed the group to come to her assistance. <clears throat> <clears throat> I was amused when the applicant just uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> took me to task about the fact that his uh, application went for close to a year. Many of you recognize me from probably over 10 meetings, over 2011 <clears throat> through 2012, <clears throat> where we, under the 86 zoning ordinance, was, had, was in a gray area when 92 was, we thought we were going to be gone under, and at that time the Planning Commission was uh, trying to abide by. And <clears throat> it took close to two years and about 10 meetings. And a, the length of that time was caused primarily by Mr. Dan Matlock, the now a, a, applicant appellant who appealed our tiny 240 square foot addition which was five times less than what he did was six feet shy of the <clears throat> excuse me the string line was three or four feet or five feet shy of the height limitation and we followed the articulation and sloping the issues which this project violates, the two-story over basement, the sanctity of the string line of the, our contiguous area is violated, the appropriateness of bulk scale and mass. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words, and all you need to do is look at the picture, and it says a thousand words. I also sent you an email, which unfortunately, because of uh, Matt going to PC, I put two comparisons, one of our home, which was approved, and one of the CAIS, which was approved, two contiguous to the applicant's uh, program. <clears throat> and I say that in all understanding, these, the flaws, the best thing that explains that is I urge you to look at Mr. Larry Taylor's Point. Now, the rest of all I was going to do was sum up the string line 
85 foot was never a question. I sold Mr. Matlock his piece of property. Every wood was in agreement of the string line. The 85 foot he agreed to acknowledged was certified by the California Coastal Commission. So when I hear what's being said tonight, I just shake my head. And I, we urge you to follow what the Planning Commission 7-0 has uh, put forth to you in resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good evening, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council Members. I'm Larry Taylor with Taylor Group, Inc., uh, 301 Mission Avenue, Oceanside. Um, I first of all want to add my voice to this gentleman. I, I was also at that Planning Commission hearing, and um, I saw nothing undue in what the Planning Commissioners did, how they conducted the hearing, or how they conducted themselves, and the decision they made to. You know, frankly, if under the 86 ordinance, if all the city did was say, stay inside the box, every house in that part of town would be 35 feet to the top of the ceiling, plus whatever they can get above that, uh, all the way out to the string line and beyond to whatever extent they can justify it. It would be a, a monolithic uh, section of, of building blocks down there, and it, it would destroy things. So the Planning Commission has a role in evaluating proposals that come before them. They don't have to say, as long as you stay within the box, uh, you're okay, and, and by the way, that has been the norm on every project I've been involved in, and there have been uh, dozens and dozens of beachfront projects I've worked on in this town. Nobody gets to build all the way out to the box on every project. Uh, as far as the string line goes, I, you know, I, I sympathize with this issue. I, I've had to deal with this a lot. The string line is very ambiguous. The, the string line exhibits that are part of the, the uh, certified LCP are terrible. It's photos with big fat lines that are reproduced so many times. They're not orthorectified photos, so you really can't even tell where the line is relative to features on the ground. So I would encourage th this council to kind of encourage <laughs> the planning division to finalize this process they've been working on to, to retrace with modern survey methods where the survey line is, consider all the, all the uh, local and coastal commission decisions that have affected the location of string lines on specific projects, finalize that document and make it part of your LCP. It'll avoid a lot of this. I, I frankly, as far as extensions beyond the string line, I think it would make everybody's life easier if that were eliminated. Um, I, I have certainly worked on some projects where there have been extensions beyond the string line, and those were always viewed in the context of the setting of the location, what was adjacent to it, what other improvements were around it, how the string line for that project compared to the improvements around it. In this particular case, you know, any extensions beyond the string line are going to go well beyond uh, what the, wh where the neighbors are, and it's been pretty well established in that area. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Terry Pagel. We represent 1609 South Pacific Street nine or ten houses north of Mr. Matlock's. I was at the planning commission meeting and I also didn't feel that there was any undue conversations. Um, one of the things that seems at that meeting was staying inside the box, the building codes and Mr. Matlock brought up numerous issues that he was within the building codes. And, and, that, and I believe him, that he's within the building codes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's within what's taking place in that area. And that's what your planning commission is trying to maintain, is something that looks more natural and fits in the area not something that's going to be whatever anybody wants to call it, three stories, four stories, all the way along there. Because as soon as this gets approved, or if it was approved, then you're going to see other residents there that are planning on adding on try and do the same thing. So you want to walk along the beach and see everything that sits there that's whatever they want to call it, three, four stories, straight up and down 
with a few decks that stick out, trying to make it look like it isn't going straight up and down. But walk down the beach and stand by the side of something like this, and that's what you're going to have. The same thing that you're going to have in San Diego, the city along the bay, everything is going higher, 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 because you can't go closer to the, the water, because they're already on the waterfront, and you still have a setback here so that the public can go along. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malik, at this time, you have one minute for rebuttal. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Stenroot is correct in his statement. Uh, he did sell us the lot. And when he sold us that lot, he asked us to pledge that we would not go out or up. But as soon as the council reversed or uh, confirmed on December 8, 2010, that they were indeed going to keep the 1986 code in place, Mr. Stenrud was the first one in January of 2011 to come forward with the project, and he was the first one that added to his property. And he broke his pledge to us because we all had an agreement. And we're all at 85 feet. I'm at 85 feet. I'm actually on the south side five inches behind the string line. On the north side of our property, 11 inches behind the string line. We're not going beyond the string line. There is no habitable space going beyond the string line. All we're talking about is decks. As for... Mr. Stenwood coming up here time and time again, he professes to have ownership in 1705 South Pacific. He does not. He's an Arizona resident. He doesn't pay taxes here, but he comes in here and pontificates as if, you know, he's part of a group that is trying to do good for the neighborhood. Okay. So, so you're, that, you're, you're at about 22 minutes now, and you were allowed to. I've got 18 seconds. Uh, I'm sorry. So. Did you reset the timer? Yeah. 18 seconds. Okay. Uh, I won't uh, deal with the, the other issues. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on uh, the structure, the string line, anything else, uh, if need be. Thank you. You can close. We will uh, go to council. Uh, Jerry Kern. Uh, before before we go, it was there questions that staff wanted to ask answer before that were brought up. No. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to make sure this isn't a very important issue, and obviously you see we are one person short tonight, and this is going to be a, a decision that I feel the whole council should make. So I'm going to move that we continue the item to hearing date on April 20th at 5 p.m. for the council deliberations in order to have the full council weigh in on this item. So that's my motion to continue the item to April 20th at 5 o'clock. I'll second that. Have some discussion on the motion? Okay. Yes, Yes, Would you like to vote on the motion, or would you like to? Yeah, yeah, are, you, are you? So this is this is uh, now discussion on the motion that's on the floor. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to say on that. Motion to continue to April twentieth, five p.m. When we have the full council here. So so we're continuing it to a date certain. It won't need if if this were to be approved, it would go to a date certain. It would not need to be renoticed. The public testimony would be closed. You would have the council deliberation and questions and, and decision at that time. Can we still ask questions at that point? At at that point, you can ask questions. There's council deliberations at that point. So whatever questions yes. you may have, you can ask. So we're voting for the continuance. Okay, thank you. Motion approved. Three one. Sanchez no. 
And uh, Deputy Mayor and Council, item number 20 has been removed from the agenda. And now we're moving on to item number 21. Oh, we have item number 23. I don't want to forget that. I missed it earlier. We I believe we already approved it. We did it? We did it. Yeah. Well, then you did it. Well, you voted it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So item number 21 is public discussion on off-agenda items. Uh, I will call you uh, four at a time, uh, and you can line up at both podiums. You'll have three minutes to address the council. Our first four speakers are Rena Morocco, Bill Roth, Dimitri Demedyev, and Pamela Wilson. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Rena Morocco, and um, full disclosure, I'm a VISTA resident, so um, I don't really have a vested interest in the billboards per se. But for the last 23 years, I've been the owner of Lynx Marketing and Promotions. We are a uh, marketing promotions agency who has used billboards in the past. When we started our agency 20 years ago, that was an exclusive um, means of advertising that we offered for our clients. My clients include ESPN, Johnson & Johnson, Samsung Electronics, Ralston Purina, companies like that. We no longer do billboards. So when I heard that you're considering billboards and when I heard some of the numbers that, that the billboard company is attaching to that, I just have to give you my perspective and my experience. And my experience is that this is a dying industry. Billboards no longer offer the same um, return to our clients that they once did. And there's a lot of reasons why, not the least of which is technology. Um, and that trend with billboards to not um, effectively promote their, the products that or their, the services that, that the advertisers, advertisers are trying to promote is going to continue, um, especially with technology where you're going to have self-driven cars. People are going to be looking like this, driving like this, not like this anymore. So I just want you to know the reality of the situation, that some of the numbers that, they're, that, that they are giving you in terms, in terms of the return have not been my experience, are not my experience. Um, things are going to much more uh, mobile type, mobile meaning mobile technology, your phone. Um, that's the trend for advertising and marketing and promotions. So I wanted to give you my two cents on that as somebody that really doesn't have a vested interest in this, as somebody that has been doing this for 23 years. Um, so that I would like you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Bill Roth, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, uh, City Manager. I speak to you as a resident of Oceanside in the Rancho de Oro area and also as a recognized expert in economic development. Progressive cities are not adding billboards. They're removing them. Billboards do not attract new business. I just spent a week last week in San Francisco working in the tech community. This does not align with their search for communities to relocate or place satellite offices. Oceanside has so much going for it. We could be a destination point for these type of progressive companies that would create jobs, that would grow our neighborhoods, that would be a symbol of our progress. Why shoot ourselves in the foot? This morning, unsolicited, I just got 21 signed petitions. I don't even know who these people are. I just went around to a few of my neighbors to get their opinion to make sure I wasn't, you know, stepping out inappropriately. And the feedback I'm getting from the neighbors is rather remarkable. Now, in my business career, I've had the privilege of being chairperson and president of numerous city organizations, including a 400-member business association. When I see this type of unsolicited response from neighbors, I think that's a signal. I think it's a signal that I hope you will consider and act accordingly. You guys are doing a great job. Why turn it around with a legacy that will mar the visual image of your work in our community 
for 50 years. It's my understanding you're talking about a 25-year contract for electronic billboards the size of freight containers with an option to renew for 25 more years. Is that really how you want your kids and grandchildren to remember you? Thank you. If there are many more speakers, we can have two of them ready to go at a time, and we could kind of move things. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is Pam Wilson. I represent Scenic San Diego. We work on behalf of eliminating uh, blights to our communities all over the county. Uh, in 2012, the council changed the sign law and carved exceptions into it that hadn't existed for decades, allowing for the very first time new billboards and billboards that could have uh, flashing lights, LEDs, and all those things on them that, had, that were previously prohibited. This was done at a time when the, your city, like many cities, were, was in dire financial straits. And I think that was at least the reason that was said to the public, why you thought this was in the best interest of the city. Fortunately, our communities are not in those dire straits anymore. So to the extent that that was a persuasive reason for any of you, I hope you'll, you'll really seriously reconsider that now. We, we know that that recession was caused in large part by corporate greed and corporate promises of profits that turned out to be illusory. I take the exact same example. The profits promised by this project are illusory. I think some other people have spoken and will speak about the fact that, especially when you compare them to the detriment and including the measurable economic detriment to your community, which I know is your top priority. Now we're 2016 and no digital billboards have yet been erected. This is because of concerted opposition beginning all the way back in 2012 when Kevin Brown and his wife Pat and some other people were fighting this before you ever changed the law. Now there are hundreds and apparently over a thousand people now supporting this whole effort and telling you that this is not what they want for this beautiful community. When this topic was last before you last June regarding the proposed sign at Rancho del Oro, there was not one single member of the public who supported that project, only the applicant. Not one. He couldn't get one person there. So I just hope those of you who are still thinking that this is something good for the city will really, really take a hard look at it. I appreciate that some of you have met with us in the past and, and thought it over, and I hope that you will and look forward to doing that again. Our communities deserve better. Digital billboards are not right for any community in this county. Many other of your colleagues on other councils have rejected them. As you know, your next door neighbor, Vista, and we hope you will uh, take another look at this. You can see how strongly your residents feel about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Dmitry Demidov, 415 Via Maria Oceanside, president of Oceanside Cultural Arts Foundation that for t uh, is organizing right now 24th annual event. You have some handouts from me. This is uh, you are the very first to see the program here of the 24th event that will be here two in two weeks from now. Uh, and you can see uh, I'm here um, to talk about uh, funding of days of, of art and ask for the city support. Uh, you can see that uh, right there on the 2016 ODA brochure, uh, we have um, placed uh, complimentary an announcement for the city Earth Fair. We do that every year. Uh, and I uh, wanted to remind the council this. Um, the Days of Art was established 24 years ago. It was a city project, okay? Uh, it was a city project. Uh, the head of Parks and Rec, uh, Pat Sanchez, came up with the idea uh, after an event in Fullerton. Uh, they organized uh, a trip on the city uh, fi uh, finances uh, to Fullerton to see how it went uh, for the Arts Commission. And the Arts Commission, as you might remember, was also so um, uh, created uh, with a suggestion of Oceanside Cultural Arts Foundation. Um, we were 
working at that time on uh, creating Oceanside Museum of Art. Um, and uh, so uh, that trip took place. The commission first organized the Days of Art. Uh, and after the first year, Tom Wilson suggested uh, that uh, it was not in a position to carry on putting out that event. So it was handed over to Oceanside Cultural Arts Foundation. From that time, and I'm, by the way, um, I was going to present this. Uh, I, I was on the agenda for 10 minutes at uh, the Arts Commission meeting earlier uh, this week, but it, they didn't have quorum. Okay, so I'm trying to squeeze it into three minutes right now. We don't have support for already 10 years from the city of Oceanside. This presentation, uh, you probably got to receive from the Arts Commission's chairman that shows uh, we have received every year support in the form of 3000 5000 7000 8000 dollars for each days of art we have not seen the support from the city of oceanside at all and um, we're also hoping that um, to create awareness about this okay we this, this is a project of the city how it was originally and we have it on our hands our budget is very small we uh, no longer have 1.2 million dollars that was matched with the city grant for the museum of art it's it's a very small budget. We have other events, other festivals, and so um, uh, anything could help. Um, even reimbursements for some of the uh, city fees, including uh, we have uh, almost two thousand dollars in city fees this year. Okay, uh, uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you. And prior to comments, just uh, I'll, I'll give you opportunity for everyone who's uh, turned in a white form. I'm just going to call everyone's name, and then you can line up as you see fit. Uh, so that would include yourself. So right now, uh, Donna McGinty, Kevin Brown, Lisa Hamilton, Jane Marshall, Adrian Hakes, Carolyn Bot Botten, Kurt Busk, Jimmy Knott, and CM Rocco. You can come and uh, stand at both podiums and line up and speak when, you, when your turn is up. Hi, everyone. I'm Jane Marshall. Nice to see you all. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on some of the activities that the No Electronic Billboard group is doing. And uh, first of all, um, we have over 1,200 signed petitions and emails and just got another 30 tonight. And we have, this is from this weekend, and it's so easy to get. We get a 93 to 95% disapproval of billboards, electronic billboards, right? So I wanted to bring you up to date with that. That's like 200 a week, easy. Um, and that's just with a couple of people going out over the weekend or going to Fraser Farms. Uh, and we haven't even gone to some of the senior communities, you know, and they're big voters, so um, you might want to consider that. Secondly, we have aligned with Scenic Oceanside and Scenic San Diego, which we're very happy about because of their experience and knowledge in this area. We feel that we can kind of leverage and gain momentum with it. Um, and in fact, we've got over 20 volunteers now. It started from this little group of two to three people, now we're over 20. And uh, a lot of our volunteers are here with our no billboard time. And um, third, we want to let you know that we're excited to participate in the Earth Day event. We have a booth and we're going to be sharing, you know, our, our thoughts and our dismay about this possibility in Oceanside with all the participants at Earth Day. So. Uh, just like Colleen Foster and her friends said, you know, that we're really working hard on managing pollution. And well, this is another visual pollution. So we're, we're going to be out there and, and trying to bring this forth to all the citizens. And lastly, I want to, um, you know, the approving this kind of billboard is only going to start a lot of controversy, a lot of lawsuits, a lot of distraction for all the good things that our city is doing. And I really want you to think about, like Bill said, is this the legacy that some of you want to leave? I know Mr. Uh, Councilman Feller, he wants to be the sports park person. And I know uh, Councilman Kern wants to go on to the areas, uh, the state assembly. And Mayor Wood wants to you know, leave his legacy of, of uh, all his years as mayor without all this controversy. So please, please, please listen to your voters, your citizens. They don't want this. Vote no on electronic billboards. Thank you. Um, I don't know if all of you have read the uh, Post News this week. Uh, there is a, a really nice article about the, uh, the uh, practice run they're making and the project being done down on um, South Coast Highway where the young man was killed on his bicycle, Logan Lipton. And uh, I traveled that today. I had no problem with it at all. I have no 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm a professional driver, but I, I had no problem. I see no problems there at all, and I'm glad it's being done. Um, <clears throat> when Logan was killed, unfortunately, we didn't have all the nice things that are there today, which will help a lot of young people, I'm sure, as time goes on, providing they're educated, providing they're educated about the safety on their bicycles and bicycle safety. The thing that concerns me more than anything is the fact that the gentleman who had that accident with Logan was not at fault. He was not cited for that accident. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to happen to him and the family and the friends, particularly to a man who, who did hit that child and the child died. And he has to carry that with him the rest of his life as his family and his associates will. I want someone to keep in mind that man still lives, he still carries that burden, and it will never go away, and I have not heard one kind word said about that gentleman or the concern we should have for his well-being as well as everyone else's. Thank you. And real quick to clarify, when I read the list of names earlier, uh, all those people whose names were listed, you're welcome to come to the podium at any point in time. So it's just I want to let you know that you're welcome to come and speak. So thank you. Kevin Brown, 2716 Norma Street, Oceanside, speaking on behalf of Scenic Oceanside, Honorable Deputy Mayor and City Council Members. As you can see from this list, there are thousands of people represented who are against the digital billboards, and this list is by no means complete. People live, play, and visit Oceanside and North County for its natural beauty and attractions. We do not want our communities blighted by ugly digital billboards. Also, this is more than just an Oceanside issue, it's a North County issue. These billboards would affect tens of thousands of people daily, not only in Oceanside, but in Carlsbad, Vista, San Marcos, and points beyond. Your actions will have far-reaching consequences now and for generations to come. For those of us that live near and travel along Highway 76 and 78, these billboards would forever be a reminder of the disregard for the community by those who voted for them. I want to thank everyone who opposes these billboards, and especially these folks behind me, who are now affiliated with Scenic Oceanside. My thanks to Jane, Lisa, Sherry, Dirk, and everyone else who is putting in a tireless effort to let this city council know that the community doesn't want digital billboards. The efforts and passion of these folks to do the right thing for our community is truly the mark of outstanding citizenship. Together, we as part of Scenic Oceanside will continue to fight these billboards and rally others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Council Members. Uh, I'm Lisa Hamilton, 323 South Bitmar. And tonight, I'd like to speak about the problem of the digital billboards suing cities in which their billboards are installed. Uh, Lamar uh, is one of the largest billboard companies in the country, and Lamar is one of the largest uh, people, uh, corporations who sues cities to be able to install their billboards as and where they please. They are a very big company, and they employ high-priced and very experienced legal help. Usually, these suits are brought uh, on the basis of the First Amendment, the right to free speech, or the Fourteenth Amendment, which is the right to due process. These are complicated and expensive suits to defend against. They bring these suits particularly against smaller communities like Oceanside, but L.A. is not immune. Currently, L.A. is fighting Lamar on several different suits, uh, one of which Lamar, I'm happy to say, just recently lost. Uh, but usually cities wind up settling because it's so expensive to fight these suits. I wish you would not open the door to these suits, 
by allowing Lamar or anybody else to put up a digital billboard because once one digital billboard is up, other digital billboard sign companies again try to sue the city on the basis of free speech, First Amendment, and due process, 14th Amendment. Beyond that, digital billboard companies are getting more involved in politics, local politics. In 2015, they supported uh, the, a, a city councilman in Los Angeles by putting up 100 different billboards in his favor, and he won. Uh, there were uh, five other city council members who were extensively supported by the digital billboard companies. That's the carrot, the suits of the stick. I ask you not to open that door. Once that door is open, we can't go back through it. Thank you. And for a lighter note, uh, I'm here tonight, Kurt Bus, 604 West Street, um, here tonight representing the Buena Vista Native Plant Club and the Oceanside Coastal Neighborhood Association, OCNA. Uh, just like to let you and the public know that this weekend, April 10th on Sunday, We'll be sponsoring our 14th annual uh, Native Plant Garden Tour. Uh, we're very happy to, uh, to let everyone know that our historic seaside community is rapidly changing over to uh, essentially all native plant um, in, in our yards, saving tons of water. Uh, starting 2 p.m. at uh, the St. Mary's School, we will lead tours throughout, the, to, uh, throughout our little community. Uh, so people can see how beautiful a native plant uh, garden can be uh, for for um, for home landscaping. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Can I ask a quick question? Are, are they going to have plants for sale too? We will have a few plants for sale, not that many, but there will be some. So get there early. Get there early. All right. Thank you. So my house is on this tour, about a block away from. Excellent. St. Yeah, you can steal my plants, Jerry. Also, I'm one of the guides. I'm one of the guides. The so nice thing about right, he made that public comment that would come steal his plants. So, okay, I'll yeah. get it. The, the nice yeah. thing about these kinds of plants is almost every cutting that you take will will grow into a new plant. So uh, I'm not Except saying mine. I'm not no saying invasive. take plants mine out of his front yard, but <laughs> thank you. So the deputy mayor is going to identify all the weeds in his yard, Correct. native plants. So we're going to go over and we're going to weed his yard for him. Correct. Thank you. It's going to be fun. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, Jimmy Knott, 127, Chair Lane. Well, the next speaker is setting up. I thought I'd go ahead here. I wanted to first say thank you to everybody in the city for conserving uh, their water. As you know, we have been in a drought, and up north they have got their El Nino in shape. However, we are still in a drought. We've only received about 52% of what we normally receive, 52%. So that means we're well behind. And we're going to ask for everyone to keep conserving. You're doing a wonderful job. And as you can see from what the graph there before you is, we only missed it by a sconch, by 1.1% for the new levels, which we have to conserve 12%. As before, we had to receive, you know, conserve 20%. And even there, we only missed it by a sconch, too which we did by 19.7%. So what I want to do is to compliment everybody for doing a, such a great job, keep up the good work, but try to give that a little bit more effort and let's take and make that 12% every month or better. And it doesn't take that much to do. Everybody knows what to do, how long to take the shower, 
how to take and carry a bucket into with you in the shower. Use that water, get twice the use out of it. Taking water out of your sink when you're doing dishes, put it on your plants, get twice the use there. Also, any other thing you can, can do, you can also do creative gardening, everything like that. Everyone knows what to do. Just do an extra bit of work. And we thank you all for doing it. Thank you all. Hi, my name is Cindy Rocco. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm here for No One Billboards in, in Total for the City of Oceanside. And not just the four billboards on the highways, but also the comprehensive sign package that will add to um, even more billboards. Right now, I'm just going to be speaking about light pollution. And in particular, the Rancho del Oro site, I went up on that site, and I'm not sure exactly where the 40 foot is going to start because there's three elevations. Um, but this is going to be about people that live in Toronto and the light that's going to be coming in that comes into their homes from the uh, flashing billboards. And I know that there's also Masa Nissan, and there's 600 new homes going in behind Walmart. And also, this is going to impact people on both sides of the highway. I just don't have those visuals. So I'm just going to play two minutes of this so you can get some feedback on reality. Um, The biggest concern, uh, obviously, are the light levels and the fact that things are changing as fast as they are. And they're just people to sleep. It's about 500 meters away from us, but that spills into so many people. Literally, you're probably looking at that light spilling into a few hundred people's windows every single night. Having a billboard like that here affects the enjoyment of our life. Uh, we like to look out at the city at night, but uh, with that billboard, it's pretty much all that you see. Uh, just a lot of noise coming in all the time. Even when the blinds are down, it, it's still a reality. You can see this light flashing. I'm a professor of landscape architecture and urban design at the University of Toronto. It's a constant distraction out of the corner of your eye. This is my bedroom, and when we sleep at night, um, those lights are very bright. Obviously, we're here with our Yes, even when these blinds, uh, we had them installed in the building, but they don't actually block all of the light coming into the room. Um, it actually got so bad that we ended up having to go out and buy these lights out blockers. When we're laying in the bed, we have to position them so that the light from the signs doesn't go into our eyes, and it helps us sleep better at night. Uh, the fact that it constantly changes is a big problem. Not so much about the signs that are uh, stationary, but the fact that it's more than every 10 seconds is very uh, disturbing. And when the billboard Any other members who had turned in white forms who uh, provided those to me earlier and whose name was called, you're welcome to speak at this time. Deputy Mayor, I see none. No more on this item. Then uh, we will adjourn to the next meeting, which is a council workshop next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Free admission. Come on down. Deputy Mayor, we're doing it in, we're adjourning in honor. Yes. Yes. And actually, um, before we start, the, the workshop next week is on the Coast Highway Corridor Study. The Coast Highway Corridor Study. So I encourage everybody that's interested in that Coast Highway Corridor Study to show up. You know, the idea we have these workshops, and even though I like talking to my colleagues, I'd rather talk to the public. Thank you. Uh, we have a. Uh, we're going to do a moment of silence. Esther had a family member pass away, so you want to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, this is uh, for Angie um, Fusat Lopez.
Her memorial is actually this coming Saturday at um, 1 o'clock at Capistrano Park. So for my Aunt Angie, thank you. Exciting week uh, last week. Picking weeds. <laughs> but however, I took my uh, seat that sat on. I sat on the part of the pavement on one side and the other. I kept scooting out, scooting down, just moving, moving on. One time I went to move along. The seat wasn't there. <laughs> Bam! I felt so stupid. <laughs> You do something stupid like that, and you say, like, oh, gee. <laughs> gee, that kind of like, what am I, five years old again? <laughs> so, that was my excitement for the week. It's <laughs> stupid. What is that? Is that a new computer? New computer, yeah. Thank you. 